can, I can introduce you, you know, this is, this is Mark Sokol. He's been working on Alzafon's experiment, right? That's a fair. That's, that's fair. I mean, we're trying a lot of different things, basically. Um, I started this group. It started off as just a WhatsApp group uh, where I found similar people who are interested in, in anti-gravity research and that were actually trying real experiments. That was my caveat. Um, actual engineers that were trying this on like a shoestring budget. And uh, we got them all into a WhatsApp group together. And it's an international team. Wayne is from Canada. Uh, we have Nam Tran from Vietnam who puts together some pretty, pretty cool stuff. Um, Jeremiah is from uh, Milwaukee. He'll be joining us uh, in a bit. And uh, he's an amazing engineer. And uh, just having everyone in the same chat box, uh, which is pretty much live. Everyone's getting live updates about different experiments that are going on. We found that to be a very inspirational and um, useful way of, you know, sharing the technology and, uh, you know, learning from each other and learning from each other's mistakes um, in order to try all different experiments related to anti-gravity, you know, whatever. But by anti-gravity, I basically mean how those flying saucers work, how the Tic Tac flew 90 degree turns, 10,000 miles an hour. So there's, there's a couple different theories that cover it. And um, right now I'm working on Alzafon. Uh, Wayne is also working on it in a much more rudimentary uh, fashion. We have seen some results, but it wasn't really um, that much above the noise floor in order to get too excited about and publish anything. And I think one of the reasons why we didn't get such good results is because we were only using 20 watts of uh, microwave power. Uh, basically, the Alzafon experiment, uh, I'll give you a little overview for those who aren't familiar. It's based on this paper by Frederick E. Alzafon, Anti-Gravity with Present Technology. It was published in 1981. And he goes into a, a unified field theory of basically gravity. He sees it more of an electromagnetic uh, function. And one thing that he realizes that on a fundamental level, the gravitic field is coming from the nucleus. It's not coming from the electrons. And one characteristic of the nucleus is chaos. Um, all the protons and neutrons, they're all spinning in, in different orientations. And there's, there's a lot of randomness, you know, second law of thermodynamics, everything gets broken down, more entropy. So he theorized it's possible to disconnect yourself from the inertial frame by making a coherent state, making all the matter uh, in the core of the atom uh, spin uh, coherently. That it's another term for this is dynamic nuclear orientation, which is a very obscure, um, you know, scientific research. Uh, it's similar to NMR and uh, much more closely related to EPR. Basically, you have a uh, laminar or homogeneous magnetic field, um, which brings about the, um, the electron orientation spins. And the electrons are spinning at the speed of light around the atom. And you're not going to be able to uh, interact with them much at that speed. But they do have a Larmor precession, similar to the way the Earth's precession spins around every 25,900 years, the precession of the equinox. This the uh, precession of the electron around the atom is directly correlated to the strength of the magnetic field because the magnetic field is just um, electron spin orientation. And by hitting it at, by hitting a sample uh, that's inside of a homogeneous magnetic field at exactly the um, Larmor precession, which is way up in the gigahertz, we're talking uh, microwave energy over here, uh, you're able to energize the electrons and with certain materials based on the hyperfine coupling between the electron and the core, you're able to then transfer the orientation of the electrons to the nucleus and slowly build up orientation in the core uh, via pulse process. Like you pulse it for a certain amount of time, that's usually in the milliseconds, and then um, allow that orientation to transfer to the core. And then you pulse it again and again and again until you uh, achieve perfect orientation. And then what should happen is the object would become weightless and possibly even like lose its inertial mass. 
uh, at which point all you would need is a very weak uh, thrust of some sort, even like a light beam would probably be enough to uh, shoot the craft off at a crazy speed if you know you achieved near 100% uh, dynamic nuclear orientation in the craft. And um, if that were to happen, uh, it's all, it's all theory what, what the um, passengers in the craft would be experiencing. Would they be experiencing gravity? They're definitely not going to be experiencing, uh, you know, inertia you know, when the craft turns because they're all in the same uh, reference field. Um, it's one way to explain uh, the flying saucer phenomena and it also explains why the craft look the way they do. Um, you know, the, the saucer shape because if you just had a large electromagnet and you wanted to follow the um, laminar field lines of uh, an, electro, an electromagnet, they, they, they come out at like a plume. Um, so if you were to follow it, you know, sort of like in a canopy underneath and, and above, then you would um, essentially have the same magnetic field lines throughout the hull. And then you could pulse the, uh, the microwaves at the Larmor precession, you know, from the outside and that will orient the craft. And um, th this, exper this experiment, um, this paper written by Frederick B. Alzafan was actually peer reviewed. And his son wrote a couple books about it after, after the father died. Um, there's two of them. This is a uh, book of the same name, Gravity Control with Present Technology. And there's the top 10 uh, UFO riddles. So basically this, is, this book is kind of like a wish list of what would happen and how it will you know, be so great for humanity and whatnot. And it also goes a little bit into an experiment that her, his dad did, uh, Frederick. He um, did it, you know, kind of like us on a shoestring budget. They borrowed equipment from a uh, university. Uh, an EPR machine is one of the most important parts is the uh, laminar magnetic field or the homogeneous magnetic field is pretty difficult to attain. And we um, can attest to that because it's, We've, we've had a lot of problems uh, shaping iron and uh, you know, getting the coils in the right shape. It's, it's very difficult to get a uh, homogeneous magnetic field uh, on a shoestring budget. And um, we, have, we have achieved a, a laminar magnetic field in a very small sample space. I'll show you the, uh, the setup in a moment. Um, but the energy levels that we're using at 20 watts, I, I don't think they're enough to... Um, say one way or another whether this uh, effect actually works. Um, so we're trying to up the uh, power using a klystron. And um, I have the klystron right over there. It's capable of 3,500 watts at, uh, I think it's somewhere in the C band where it, where it operates. And uh, we, got a, we got a bunch of waveguides and stuff from a lab that's going out of business. And uh, the power supply behind me, this, this this big hunk of metal um, is what's going to power the uh, Klystron. It's 5,000 volts at half an amp. Um, I've been having trouble. Uh, I was working on it the other day. I think one of the switches on it. Mark, up. can I can I ask you a question? Sure, go ahead. Obviously, I don't speak your language, but you said you're going to go for 20 watts or 20 kilowatts. Oh, so it was 20 watts originally with the see this um, device over here. That's yeah. the uh, traveling wave tube amplifier. Um, and that can only uh, put out 20 watts. So we're going from 20 watts to about 2,500 watts. Okay, 2,500 watts. So you're telling me, are you being successful at 20 watts? Um, we have not seen anything that really rose above the, um, the noise field. You know, it, All right, do you see a threshold somewhere? Yeah, th there might be a threshold. And also one thing that David told me, which was very telling is that when his dad did the experiment in 94, they achieved 80% weight loss within a second. And 80% within a second? 80% within, or even less than a second. You, see, you watch their graphs, it's pretty amazing. Um, but he also told me that the uh, sample heated up, which uh, to me obviously means that they're using a lot more than 20 watts um you know in their experimentation and ultimately what happened there the reason why we're not seeing uh you know flying saucers or, or, or craft based on this principle is because of the egos of everyone that was involved they all uh, started fighting over uh, who owns what in a company that never existed and then the uh 
university wanted their EPR machine back. And rather than tell the truth that they made a massive discovery, they went and just took the whole thing apart. And, um, you know. So, you know, the, the question about you asking about a saucer, um, are you aware of what Paul Potter did per se and Andresian? Uh, I, I saw his book. I haven't read it or understood it a hundred percent. I'm, I flipped through it, you know, pretty okay. briefly. If you go back to, to, uh, to Meyer in Switzerland, um, he says that he put a microphone out there and I've got it somewhere that I couldn't find it to save my life. Where there's an, a UFO over his head and he's got it going and his fear, you know, if you heard it, it sounds like rotating machinery. And if anything, it's like Searle's device where you've got some crap running around rotating. And that would be the ideal reason for why you're going for a saucer. Now, um, if even if you look at some of these triangular spacecrafts, you'll find three or four circles, glowing circles, and I call them sphere constellations. Right. Um, and I'm just kind of curious, are we talking about something close to that or not? Um. Uh, it's possible that, that it all is the same technology with different ways of achieving it. Um, one thing that uh, David Alsafon told me that his father told him is that this effect is also achievable through mechanical means, just using an electromagnet and um, having the aluminum disc. There's a reason why you have to use aluminum because of the hyperfine coupling and the, uh, the, the memory effect of the metal. Um, ultra pure you know, like five nine aluminum. You want very pure aluminum mixed in with a little bit of iron. Um, okay. The, the the thing is that in some of the experiments we ran, that the magnetic field is so strong, uh, aluminum magnetizes. Oh, what strength are you talking about? Uh, we've done it on our our energy box, which has about one tesla or so, one to two tesla, and uh, the top part is a, a piece to hold a carousel together. And uh, it's aluminum, about a half inch thick aluminum. And you put anything on there, it's magnetized. Uh, we're not using anywhere near uh, one Tesla. In fact, um, the highest frequency that we ran this experiment at was nine and a half gigahertz. And no, no, I, I don't understand what that would mean. What yeah, I'm saying so is by Tesla, by Tesla I mean, um, point three. You look at the strength of the magnets. Right, right. That's start adding everything together. It comes out to a Tesla. Well, if I could jump in real quick, do you think aluminum might be used to smooth out the magnetic field too? Because aluminum is diamagnetic, yeah. right? So, so what, what, Paul? What you're talking about is with with the and and the, the energy box was more of an SEG style replication. So with something like that, where you got lots of magnets, big magnets rotating fast you'd be probably diamagnetic magnetizing the aluminum, which, yeah. yeah. But, but then what, what I'm wondering is with like, when Mark was talking about creating that homogenous magnetic field, right? Maybe you could use aluminum components to help smooth out that field, make it more well, even. I, I'm kind of curious what he means by homogeneous uh, field. Are we talking about uh, something near points and sources, which means it's not homogeneous or something that that is uh there's no gradient there's no gradient exactly no flux in the field um, so that's from that's a far field type of effect though right right so it's 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 out in the open uh out in the open air where, where so we are we talking about a device that's doing this or we're we talking about riding on the uh magnetic field from the earth oh the device itself is doing this really yeah okay um Can I so Jump one, in here. Uh, let me just let me just finish one more thing, okay? Um, so one thing that uh, David also found, which is Frederick's son, said is that it's possible to achieve this effect without microwaves, through um, just by you know the dynamic nuclear orientation effect by spinning an aluminum disc within the laminar magnetic field. And I, when you look at the ARV from Mark and Canlish. Um, that's exactly what you have over here. You have a aluminum disc, or they call it a flywheel, means that it spins inside of the center of a electromagnet. And that would be the most homogenous spot in a magnetic field. And if, um, if that was dynamically uh, polarized, 
um, the effect actually goes out beyond the um, the disc itself. It's it's sort of contagious, similar to the way you know magnetism magnetizes things around it. Um, dynamic nuclear orientation, according to uh, David, is contagious to the rest of the craft, and then the Earth's incoherent uh, gravitic field then has to fight against it and gets weakened in in the process, and then uh, there's something in the base or there's somewhere else in the craft that's actually producing, you know, a traditional thrust, uh, which could be, you know, just one, you know, 1% or less of the actual weight of the craft in order to move it around. Uh, Mark, when I was talking to uh, Mark's ARB is that uh, the circular part might be used just to generate electrical power. And secondly, it's like a distributor that elects, sends all the electricity to each of these leaves uh, slices of these huge pieces of copper and he rotates it as a function of time and that's how it's generating a levitation. Uh, so you're saying that the uh, that this is generating high voltage field and yeah uh, and that's, that's one way of, that's just you know one way of looking at it. Yes yeah, uh, listen I'm not I'm not you know diehard set but, on my, on but the thing, thing you got to think about is that you've got these pie pieces here in the base. Right. And these are thick laminated and they might be insulated from each other electrically. So they're going to generate some strange results. But the other thing is that the red thing is also a coil. Right. So you've got this splice thing together with its field and you're coupling over another magnetic field, electromagnetic field above it with this other ring. So, right. you know, this is like, um, putting a piece of levitation over a piece of metal. Well, that looks great uh, if it's super cold, cooled. It, it moves and hey, that's great on a piece of metal, but can I do that in flight? Well, this concept might allow you to do that. So he's got a, a the splice thing here and a separate ring around it. Right, and you think the, um, the uh, parallel plate capacitors in the base, they're generating a thrust effect? Is, is that what you're trying to say? Um, you mean for a thrust control system? Yeah. I got nothing to say about that. The only way you can do that is by regulating the voltage and the electric current you have over each of these splices. Slices. Right, right. That's, that's similar to what I was thinking is going on in the base, that there's, there's actually pulses going through it, similar to the Podkonov experiment, you know, the impulse experiment with Podkonov. Um, instead of using superconductors, they're just using uh, whatever material was in there. Um, and uh, they're pulsing it very quickly in order to create some um, uh, unidirectional uh, impulse on the craft. But I, I would say those tanks are probably for environmental control for the guys, the survivors, rather than having anything to do with propulsion or anything. Yeah, I, I think so too. I think that they might be oxygen and hydrogen for a hydrogen fuel cell, which is okay. how which is how I would make a craft. Like if you're going to fly in outer space, you're not going to want to use a battery, uh, maybe a battery supplement. I was thinking more like the Toyota Mirai mixing a uh, hydrogen fuel cell with uh, a battery system. And the advantage of that is that you have now water in case you're stuck somewhere. So water is a great thing to have in outer space. And also the water can be used as a spin ballast because if you're spinning something around, there's a tendency for the craft to start spinning in the opposite direction. So you can have a spin ballast, like a tube that goes around the craft fit and fill it with water and spray that out every once in a while if you're, if it's spinning too fast. 